Stiftung and I'm from the Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care at the University Hospital in Gothenburg. Uh, I will try to provide some aspects on the management of acute uh, right ventricular failure. Um, this is a very uncommon clinical syndrome, but whenever it occurs, it is associated with uh, impaired morbidity uh, and high mortality, and it's very difficult to treat once it occurs. So we start with some basic uh, physiology. The permanent <coughs> circulation is a low resistance, low pressure, high capacity circuit. Uh, both the pulmonary arteries and veins are very compliant, they are very distensible. So if you increase cardiac output a lot, there is a very minor change in pulmonary artery pressure. Uh, if you look at the right ventricle, the right ventricle stroke work is only one-sixth of the left ventricle. That's why uh, the, it's relatively thin-walled compared to the left ventricle. And the combination of this thin-walled ventricle and the crescent-shaped geometry, and also the longitudinal orientation of the muscle fiber, makes the uh, right ventricle very intolerant to uh, increase the right ventricle afterload. It has been, this is a cartoon from uh, an experimental study, and you can see that a moderate uh, increase in mean arterial, uh, uh, sorry, mean pulmonary artery pressure has a pronounced fall in the stroke volume compared to the left ventricle. So the right ventricle is very sensitive to changes in afterload. So here is a schematic drawing of the pathophysiology of acute uh, right ventricular failure, for example, in pulmonary hypertension. So when the right ventricle is faced to a right ventricular pressure load, as for example in pulmonary embolism, uh, it starts to fail and the output from the right ventricle decreases, causing an underfilling of the left ventricle. Furthermore, the decompensated uh, right ventricle increases its volume and that will cause a shift of the septum to the left. So the septum will uh, compress the left ventricle. The uh, distensibility of the left ventricle will decrease, also decreasing preload. And the decrease in preload will, of course, uh, diminish cardiac output, diminish the blood pressure, and then uh, you will have problems with the right ventricular coronary perfusion. And that will cause ischemia, and that will further be enhanced by the dilated right ventricle with an increase in uh, wall tension, which will increase oxygen uh, requirements. And then you will have more right ventricular decompensation, uh, more underfilling of the left ventricle, and you will have a vicious circle uh, coming into uh, cardiogenic shock. And when you are in this situation, it's very difficult to treat. I have here listed both cardiac conditions and extracardiac conditions um, causing right ventricular failure. Of course, you have a large right ventricular infarction, or if you have a valvular heart disease, for example, mitral stenosis or mitral insufficiency, or a cardiomyopathy involving also the right ventricle. Other patients undergoing cardiac surgery may develop severe heart, uh, right ventricular heart failure. And the problem in heart transplantation it's not left ventricular failure, it's almost exclusively right ventricular failure. And if you have a patient with a, a poor left ventricular function undergoing an insertion of the left ventricular assist device, when you start this device, venous return to the right ventricular will increase, and in some patients uh, uh, it will uh, develop into a right ventricular failure, requiring a uh, right ventricular assist device at least temporarily. Extracardiac conditions, pulmonary embolism, lung disease, uh, this is very severe, uh, very important cause of right ventricular failure, the primary pulmonary hypertension, and also in sepsis, and lung transplantation, and also after performing from endotherectomy in patients with uh, chronic pulmonary embolism. <coughs> But right ventricular failure rarely occurs in the, in the, occurs in the setting of female, uh, normal pulmonary vascular resistance, so it must be elevated. So, how should you manage right ventricular failure? First of all, optimize right ventricular preload. Don't try to give too much fluid if you have a patient with uh, hypertension 
and a high uh, central venous pressure, as you see in the right ventricular failure, try to maintain preload, CVP below 15 millimeters of mercury. Above that, it's only uh, contraproductive to give volume because the, left, uh, the right ventricle will dilate, the tension will increase, and you will have a more backward failure, and you can induce even more severe, sorry, tricuspid um, regurgitation. It's also very essential that you uh, maintain systemic pressure very high by the use of, for example, norepinephrine to uh, ensure that you have a good right ventricular perfusion. Right ventricle is perfused both in systole and diastole. And for that reason, you could use norepinephrine. This is probably the most important drug and treatment uh, uh, for right ventricular is the use of norepinephrine. Another important aspect on the use of norepinephrine is that if you have a high systemic pressure, that will also improve the left ventricular assist. I can try to explain that. Here you have a, a, a diastolic ventricular interaction in right ventricular failure. It's the normal situation to the left, left ventricle septum, lateral part, and theory portion. Here is the right ventricle. And in patients with pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular failure, you see that it's dilating, it's forcing the septum into the left here. And if you have an almost complete um, deterioration of right ventricular function, the right ventricle is dependent on the movement of the septum. Because in this situation, the, left vent the septum will try to um, uh, help the right ventricle. It, you will see a paradoxical movement of the septum, so now the septum is pumping for the right ventricular. And uh, this so-called left ventricular assist is improved by keeping systemic pressure high with, for example, norepinephrine. Here is a sec uh, from a patient with a severe right ventricular failure. It's the right ventricle. You see a small compressed left ventricular septum is bulging into the left ventricle. So, I said that you should use norepinephrine, but wouldn't that cause an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance? Could you really use norepinephrine in this situation? Because if you give norepinephrine, potentially you will constrict the pulmonary vascular bed and increase uh, pulmonary artery pressure and increase the load. So, what are the effects of norepinephrine on the pulmonary circulation? That is something that has not been studied a lot. Uh, we have some data published, or at least going to be published, hopefully. Here we have two categories of patients. One group with vasoplegia after cardiac surgery. They are dependent on norepinephrine. And here is a patient with septic shock, also norep a group with uh, uh, norepinephrine-dependent septic shock. And in these two studies, we have um, randomly changed infusion rates to study hemodynamics at the pressure, systemic pressure of 60, 75, and 90. And as you expect, uh, systemic vascular <coughs> resistance, as you see here, increases with increasing doses of norepinephrine. But if you look at the pulmonary vascular bed, the situation is somewhat different. Even though you uh, double infusion rates in of norepinephrine from here to here in both groups, you see no significant change in pulmonary vascular resistance. So we can see no data, we have no data to suggest that norepinephrine is pulmonary vasoconstrictor. So you can, I think you can use norepinephrine in uh, right ventricular failure and pulmonary hypertension because it does not uh, increase vascular resistance. So uh, now if you have maintained blood pressure with norepinephrine, left ventricular cyst, and you still have problems with right ventricular failure, you can inhale a pulmonary vasodilator, for example, nitric oxide, postacycline, or milrinone. But why, don't we, why, can we, why can we not use intravenous vasodilation? If you give, for example, postacycline, nitric oxide, you will decrease pulmonary vascular resistance, but on the same time, you will also induce hypotension. So you cannot use uh, pulmonary vasodilators intravenously because you will always decrease mean arterial pressure jeopardizing coronary perfusion. 
So it was suggested many years ago that, um, uh, well, why don't you use prostaglandins? Because uh, there are some data indicating that they are selectively pulling the waste of the potatoes if you give them intravenously. We have addressed that uh, some years ago now, and uh, here we have measured the so-called pulmonary vascular resistance, systemic vascular resistance ratio, which are uh, a variable where you can assist selectivity. In a normal situation, this ratio is 0.1. You can have a PDR of 100, SDR is 1,000. That is the normal situation. This group of patients have an elevated pulmonary vascular resistance and the PDR or PDR SDR ratio was elevated. And then we give prostacycline, prostaglandin E1, sodium nitroprusside, and nitroglycerin with no selectivity at all. It decreased both systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance, causing hypotension. So uh, the treatment of right ventricular um, failure was revolutionized when inhaled nitric oxide was introduced. In the schematic drawing here we have the alveoli, you inhale nitric oxide that diffuses into the muscular layer of the pulmonary artery bed, uh, increases levels of granulate cyclase, increasing cyclic GMP, causing vascular relaxation. Cyclic GMP can be traced out in the uh, blood Nitric oxide is taken up by red blood cells and it's metabolized down to nitrates and nitrates and el eliminated in, in urine. The problem with NO is it can react with oxygen molecules, creating NO2 dissolved in water, which will cause nitric acid and peroxynitrate, which all have cytotoxic effects. So you have to monitor your levels of NO2. Uh, and we did a similar study with nitric oxides, uh, demonstrating the selectivity to decrease PVR with no effects on full uh, systemic vascular resistance, in contrast to all the intravenous vasodilators. Here is a study on uh, the use of inhaled nitric oxide in patients with right ventricular failure caused by ARDS. 26 patients with right ventricular failure. Uh, in the study, incremental inhaled concentrations of nitric oxide were used. And you can see here that the, the baseline data, PDR goes down, and immediately when you stop inhaling, it comes back to normal. And you see cardiac output was increased because you know, unload the right ventricle, no systemic effects, and a moderate decrease in mean pulmonary heart pressure. And I think this slide also illustrates that you cannot assess the effects of inhaled nitric oxide just by measuring uh, pulmonary artery pressure. For example, non-invasively by echocardiography, because you see here that a large fall in PVR substantially increases cardiac output and very small effects on pulmonary artery pressure. So you need to measure pulmonary vascular resistance, otherwise you cannot evaluate the effects of any inhaled treatment. Here is a study on uh, the use of NO in right ventricular failure of the posterior uh, acute myocardial infarction. Uh, patients having cardiogenic shock because of that, and then inhaled a, a large, a too large dose in my mind. And they, here we have the hemodynamic data. We start with the uh, central venous pressure, right ventricular pressure was high, almost 20. Pulmonary artery pressure relatively high. PVR also elevated, it should be around 150. Cardiac index low. And when they inhale nitric oxide, uh, right ventricle was unloaded, CVP decreased, full nitric decreased, full vascular resistance increased dramatically, and cardiac output increased. With no systemic effects, pulmonary capillary wedge unchanged, systolic tear pressure unchanged, systemic resistance unchanged, as well as heart rate. So, uh, there are some case reports uh, using, describing the effects of nitric oxide in pulmonary embolism. Here is uh, uh, the rationale why should you use uh, nitric oxide in, by inhalation in pulmonary embolism. Of course, uh, the pulmonary embolism will increase resistance in the lung vascular bed because it will reduce the cross-section area. You have a lot of emboli. Uh, but there is also an interaction between the emboli and the pulmonary vascular endothelium that will release several sub substances like thromboxanes, leukotrienes, late activating factors which constrict pulmonary vascular bed. 
Furthermore, if you have a sluggish flow because of severe cardiac shock, it has also been uh, shown that uh, that will cause hemolysis with release of free hemoglobin, which will bind available nitric oxide. Here is a case report, a 66-year-old woman with a tumor, brain tumor. She came to ICU because of severe dyspnea and the perfusion skin program revealed a severe perfusion defect. The only part of the lungs that were perfused was the right lower lobe. And here was an angiography which confirms it finding No perfusion of the left lung and very poor in the upper right lung. This patient, uh, uh, there was a contraindication of phosphothrombolysis because of the brain tumor, but she received heparin infusion and went to the ICU, as I said, uh, becoming more unstable, requiring norepinephrine. She was hypoxic, intubated, and there they started inhaling nitric oxide. And here is some of the data. The PF ratio, you see the oxygenation improved after one hour, improved further after six hours, pH increased and there was a dramatic increase in arterial pressure because now we have more blood coming over to the left ventricle, cardiac output increases and blood pressure increases. Well, there are some limitations with the use of nitric oxide. Um, once you uh, discontinue nitric oxide, you may have a rebound pulmonary hypertension. You have to de discontinue it slowly, gradually, otherwise there will be rebound vasoconstriction. There are some issues with the toxicity with hemoglobinemia, NO2. Equipment are relatively complicated and it's relatively expensive. So uh, many of us have discussed various inhaled alternatives to nitric oxide, such as inhaled prostacycline for treatment of pulmonary hypertension. We have some experience with that. Um, this is a schematic drawing. Here you have the vascular smooth muscle cell, the endothelial layers. There is the uh, vascular lumen with a thrombocyte platelet. So if you give it intravenously prostacycline, for example, there is, we have a pronounced inhibition of platelet aggregation. It will diffuse across the endothelium, increasing levels of cyclic AMP and cause relaxation. The rationale was that if you instead inhaled aerosolized prostacycline, you will increase cyclic AMP with no effects on platelet or systemic effects because of the diffusion out to the vascular lumen. Was that so? Well, um, some years ago now we studied the effect of aerosolized prostacycline in high pulmonary vascular system after cardiac surgery, and you see here relative elevation over the pulmonary vascular system and a dose dependent fall in pulmonary vascular systems with inhaled prostacycline. And 20 minutes, one half an hour, it, the, day, the values came back to the uh, control values. Another option could be to inhale millinone, the phosphodiesterase inhibitor, uh, which we have done. Here we have inhaled three concentrations of millinone. This is the stem solution. <coughs> One milligram per milliliter is what dil diluted to 0.5 and then to 0.25. And we could see that uh, the optimal effect on the pulmonary vascular system was uh, when we inhale the stem solution. Very simple, you take inhale millinone aerosolized either in spontaneously breathing patients or in the, uh, uh, those undergoing mechanical ventilation. Uh, you see almost no effect on systemic vascular resistance here, the white bar. So it seems that inhalation of prostacycline also can induce, <coughs> prot uh, sorry, both prostacycline and millinone can induce selective pulmonary vasodilation. So we use prostacycline for inhalation in the ICU. Uh, we take a solution of, uh, 10 micrograms per milliliter and administer continuously 5 to 10 milliliters per hour. Uh, when the patients are awake, you can uh, start with iloprost, uh, which has uh, another prostaglandin, which has much longer half-life, so you can uh, provide that intermittently six to nine times per day. And there is a new prostaglandin called triprostenil, which even more prolonged half-life that you can administer four times a day. And millinone, we uh, need to administer continuously. So you can use various combinations. There is a device that we use for uh, inhalation in mechanically ventilated patients. You put it here on the inspiratory uh, part of the system. And you don't need any um, 
humidifi uh, humidifier here because this continuous um, uh, delivery of uh, the aerosolite post cycling or maybe not. So uh, you can also combine uh, inhaled prostacyclin with Librinol, and the rationale for that is the prostacyclin will increase uh, levels of cyclic AMP, and Milrinone phosphodiesterase inhibitor will uh, decrease the conversion from cyclic AMP back to ATP that will have a, uh, the potentiation of the effects. Here we, uh, in the group of uh, patients with high pulmonary vascular resistance after cardiac surgery, we first inhaled prostacyclin, and then we added milrinone, and you can see that they had additive effects. So in fact, you can uh, attach two nebulizers in series on the inspiratory limb, and you will have additive effects. So, it's very important to remember that there are some prerequisites for a successful treatment of the right ventricular failure. First of all, pulmonary vascular system must be high, if it's normal, there will see no effect, of course. Uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance must be reversible. It cannot be fixed. If you have a patient with severe mitral stenosis or mitral insufficiency with high resistance, some of those patients, you cannot dilate them at all. They have a fixed resistance. And then, of course, you will not have any success with inhalation therapy. And the right ventricular failure, it must be an isolated right ventricular failure. Because if you start to inhale, Vasodilators with in patients with left ventricular failure, you will move blood volume from the right side over to the left, and the filling of the left ventricle will increase. And if you have left ventricular failure, the left ventricle is over, already overfilled. So you cannot inhale patients with left ventricular failure. That is a contraindication. That will only cause pulmonary edema. So it must be an isolated right ventricular failure to be successful. What about inotropic support? I have here listed the most common uh, inotropic agents, and here we have the most powerful. They are all inotropes, but they have different actions on the vascular bed. Here we have the vasoconstrictors, and here we have the vasodilators. So uh, you can use a moderate dose of uh, dopamine or dobutamine. Uh, it depends on the heart rate. You can combine that with either milrinone or, uh, but it's very important that you don't forget norepinephrine here to maintain systemic pressure for perfusion, the right coronary artery, and for the left ventricular assist. So that is the common combination that we use, but of course you can also use levosimendin, and we have recently shown that we have compared levosimendin with millionone in patients, and we, there is absolutely no difference on the inotropic or leucotropic effects uh, of these two agents in patients. So, uh, usually two or three agents in this condition. <coughs> so, uh, if uh, this treatment is not enough, you need to put the patient on uh, that lean arterial ECMO, catheter in the femoral artery and a long one up to the right atrium, uh, oxygenator, etc. And uh, we have some successful cases in patients with pulmonary embolism and right ventricular failure. And cardiogenic shock, really not responsive to any treatment, and then um, if you put them on the ECMO and you give heparin infusion and you just last wait for a couple of hours, days, and uh, the, the clots in the pulmonary vascular bed will be uh, uh, lysed with the heparin. A situation where we have been at here ECMO and the device that we use it's very user friendly it's, here we have the tubes and this one you can dislodge from this console and you can take this with the patient for example to an ambulance or to another hospital what about ventilation each time you inflate the lungs you, there will be a compression of the pulmonary vascular bed so what kind of peak level should you use in these patients uh, this is the relationship between the lung volume and the pulmonary vascular resistance. You can see it's typically U-shaped, so resistance is lower at FRC, but if you distend the lungs with higher and higher levels of PEEP, 
uh, food and rescue system will go up. On the other hand, if you have de-recruitment, lung volumes decreases, you will have hypoxic constriction <coughs> and resistance uh, increases. So you need to find an optimal peak level to have the lowest pulmonary vascular resistance. And that you have to titrate individually uh, in the patients, for example, by following uh, mixed venous oxygen saturation. And you find the peak level with the best mixed venous oxygen saturation. So, uh, which is the optimal peak level? This was addressed uh, in a study where they measured pulmonary vascular resistance in patients with ARDS. Uh, to have the, I mean, pulmonary vascular resistance is mean pulmonary artery pressure minus left atrial pressure. And that you can usually be assessed by the wedge pressure of the pulmonary artery catheter. But the problem is that you, if you uh, apply PEEP, um, you will not have a good measurement of the left atrial pressure because it will be more and more affected by the alveolar pressure. So in this study, they put a catheter in the left ventricle <coughs> and measured the left ventricle and diastolic pressure as a surrogate for left atrial pressure. And they found that from zero up to five in this group there was a fall in pulmonary vascular resistance, but if you apply the higher peak levels, um, resistance will not go down. So don't use too high peak. Levels. So moderate PEEP levels will increase pulmonary vascular resistance. Of course, you should avoid anesthesiosis, <coughs> and hypoxia. Uh, that is self-evident. And the problem here, if you have high ventilator rates, you will have an intrinsic PEEP gas trapping, which will also increase resistance. So uh, final slide here. Uh, this is the multimodal approach in the treatment of pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular failure. You try to maintain CVP below 50 millimeters of mercury. Don't take it up higher in right ventricular failure. It will not work. Treat hypertension with norepinephrine. Uh, induce selective reduction of PVR by inhalation of pulmonary vasodilators. Can only be successful in isolated right ventricle and you need to have a high reversible PVR, otherwise inhalation therapy will not work. Inotropic therapy by a combination of uh, dopamine to butamine, some of millinon or levosimendin. And finally, if you have problems uh, in spite of this treatment, uh, try ECMO. And try to optimize the ventilatory set, uh, settings with the low tidal volume, six or seven milliliters per body weight, kilo body weight, moderate to low peak levels, and low breathing frequency to avoid air trap again, normal cavity. So thank you very much for your attention.